Hi, and welcome back to Love English. I'm Leila, and in today's lesson, I want to share what I think is some particularly powerful language. Today, we'll be looking at vocabulary that you need in order to have a necessary conversation. This conversation might be with friends, family, or even a complete stranger. But this is a conversation that we all need to be having in order to inspire change. Now, just over a month ago, George Floyd, a black man going about his day-to-day -day business, was killed by a white police officer. In that moment, not only did George Floyd lose his life, but a little girl lost her father. And the Black Lives Movement was reawakened. In response to George Floyd's death over the past month, we have seen protests around the world. Demonstrations and protests in the name of the Black Lives Matter movement. A movement that is asking for a very simple thing. Equality. Justice. For the simple right that black lives do matter. Now, as an English teacher, one of my fundamental beliefs is that language can inspire change. That conversation, dialogue, discussion will enable us to think differently. To understand other people's experiences and to learn, because that is the only way we're going to see real change happen. The Black Lives Matter movement is much more than a hashtag. It stands for social change, for equality, for the basic fundamental human rights for all, no matter your race, your nationality, the color of your skin. Today's lesson is in support of the Black Lives Matter movement and is aimed to inspire you to use your voice to be a part of the change and to speak out against racism in whatever form you come across it. Now, importantly, this conversation, this discussion is something I myself need to be participating in. So today I have invited three inspiring women, incredible YouTube creators onto the show to have a Zoom conversation with me. So this will be great listening practice for you and will also provide some real insight into what the Black Lives Matter movement means and how you can help support it. So for that conversation, you can go here in the video and I will also include snippets of the conversation throughout the lesson as I'm explaining the vocabulary to you. Now to follow Petty, Jess and Kimmy and to learn a little bit more about them, you can of course go down in the description and click their links to their YouTube channels, their amazing YouTube channels. And of course, you can also follow them on Instagram. Now, finally, before I get started, just to let you know that the profits from the ads revenue for the next month or so, while it's kind of growing, uh, will be going to the Black Lives Matter movement. If you would like to make a donation, you can see the links in the description box and whatever you feel like you can donate, please do. Right, let's get started. The first word I want to start with is actually a more positive word. Empowerment, empowerment. Or of course, to empower the verb. This is a process of giving a group of people more freedom and rights. Now, the Black Lives Matter movement is not about having more rights than white people, but it is about having equal rights and equal freedoms. At this moment, we are seeing a movement a movement that is destabilizing the current ideology, the belief and way of thinking in our society that basically disadvantages black people. The movement is aiming to empower black people and indeed white to encourage change and to encourage a more equal distribution of social power. Black Lives Matter is just that. Like we actually matter too. It's mm -hmm. not that we matter more. It's not that mm -hmm. we matter less, we just matter too. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when people understand that, because every time I think about that even, it always comes to my mind that there will be someone watching who's like, well, all lives matter, right? There's that whole thing. That's what and I for me, Yeah, and for me, it's like, of course, of course, all lives matter. No one's saying they don't. But yeah. right now, it's just, it feels like my life doesn't matter. That's what it feels exactly. like. It feels yeah. like me as a black person, my life doesn't matter. So I'm trying to say my life, it's almost like the hashtag or the, the movement should have been Black Lives Matter too. Yeah. Number two, the word that keeps coming up, race, racism. 
Now, when we're talking about racism, we are referring not only to black people, but in fact, where there is a discrimination, where people are treated differently and unfairly because of the color of their skin, their nationality, where they're from. Racism is a belief that the qualities of a person are based on their race and that members of other races, other than your own, are not as good in some way. They are not equal to you. They are less than the group that you feel you belong to. Now, this belief results in the unfair treatment of other races. You will treat them differently, worse than people of your own race. Some collocations that often go with racism, combat, tackle, fight. You fight, you tackle racism. In a moment, I'm going to explain the different types of racism that exist within our society. Now, racism is the noun, but racist is the noun that we would use to refer to a person who holds these beliefs, the belief that other races are not equal to theirs, and therefore their treatment of them is not good. Now, here's the importance of understanding language. Now, many people will say, I'm not racist. I'm not racist. And here's the importance of understanding the power of language here. When you say you're not racist, fine, fair enough. But in fact, what you should be saying, what you want to be able to say in order to support the Black Lives Matter movement is that I am anti-racist. I'm anti-racist. And understanding that no matter your skin color, your nationality, where you are from, you are equal. And the belief, perhaps, that there is only, in fact, one race, the human race. So bear that in mind. It's not enough to say that I'm not racist, but you need to be anti-racist fighting, speaking out, calling out racism and combating racism. It, it, it confuses me that our fight to end racism is a debate. Like why, why do people combat ending racism or combat that Black Lives Matter at all? Like it's, it's like the All Lives Matter um, hashtag has been a racist hashtag. Like people just say All Lives Matter because they don't believe Black Lives Matter. And I, and it is frustrating and it's really frustrating to see how blatant we get killed in the streets, which is why this hashtag came about, because we're just we're tired. We're tired of being treated, not treated equally. Number five, racialization, racialization. The concept of racialization refers to the processes by which a group of people are defined by their race. Processes of racialization begin by attributing racial meaning to people's identities, in particular, as they relate to social structures and institutional systems, such as housing, employment, and education. The racialization of the black community has significantly disadvantaged them. Now, I want to talk about some forms of racism because racism is not always obvious. It's not always clear. It's not always about someone shouting racial slurs, bad words, at another person. Racism can be covert, covert. So covert racism is racism that is not obvious. It's hidden or secret. And in the conversation, you will hear us talk about overt and covert racism. Overt is referring to something that is public, open, obvious. Covert racism is arguably much harder to deal with than overt racism. We can also talk about microaggressions. This is something that comes up in the conversation again. This is a term that we can use for brief, but daily, regular, verbal, behavioral, environmental indignities. Whether intentional or even unintentional, it really doesn't matter here. It's a hostility, microaggression, micro hostilities, derogatory or prejudicial, slights, insults, towards any particular group or individual. Now, in this case, we can talk about racist microaggression or racial microaggression. And again, we'll be talking about this more in the conversation. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask you another question that's a little bit more personal, but kind of obviously relating to how you guys obviously feel, is that have you, or even if you wanna talk about someone that you know, family member, friend, been affected by race, racism, have you felt that someone has been directly racist towards you and and how did you deal with that hmm. gosh i don't i don't i don't 
think I've experienced racism directly or or maybe I have and I've just suppressed the memory but um I remember or maybe I just about- or maybe I just didn't notice because there's like <laughs> Michael like micro racism just everywhere just like little microaggressions where people just do things and it's like it is racist but you don't actually pick it up um but when this, we were at next ten, I remember you saying some. I don't know if it was something about your hair. Someone making some comment on about your hair or something. Is that my imagination? Oh no! Oh yeah! So no, people always try to touch my hair. So yes, that is a thing. That is a racist thing. That's You're right. Your hair. That's so. Invasive. People are always trying to touch my hair. It is. It's matter of fact. I was with one of my friends. Oh God! You just brought up a memory. Sorry. I was with one of my friends here in London. We were by the the waterfront somewhere. I can't remember. It's like South London somewhere. Uh, and we were at this restaurant and we went to just like, we were getting takeout and this white guy, I guess he was like some type of rich lawyer or whatever. He was talking to us and, um, one of his friends from the table walked up clearly drunk. I could see it already. I'm like, oh my God, I'm looking at Tanda and I'm like, I want to go, but we already paid for this really expensive food. So it was like, I want to wait for my food though. So the guy starts coming up, he's talking to us and he just beelines toward me and he's just looking at me and he's just like, I really love your hair and took both, ha- before I could even react, both hands were already in my head and he was doing this and I'm like, what the, f-? and his friend was like, you can't do that. You can't just like touch her hair and Tanda, like my friend Tanda, she was like, why are you touching her hair? And he was like, oh, it's fine. And I'm just like, but that's, uh, that's an great, like space it's how is that different to grabbing someone's boobs exactly or right. any, not not even black people's hair anyone's hair like I wouldn't walk up, if I didn't know you I wouldn't walk up to you and just like start playing with your hair like who does that yeah so like it was and then that's another thing that black people face because it's like if you show any type of rage or aggression then you're an angry black woman yeah so it's like I had to hold everything in me back because I wanted to fucking punch him in the face. But I was like, I knew they would have seen me as the aggressor. So I'm just like, I just really calmly told him, don't touch my hair. That's just so, it's just wrong. I mean, it's not over. Yeah. Racism doesn't have to be over. It doesn't have to be yeah. black, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For me, that's racist. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah, definitely. And you're right. And that's why I didn't think about it at first. It is different about you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, it, even even that, it's like, it makes you question, it, it's, there's so many layers to it because you start to think, what is it about me or you that makes you think that's okay? Like, am I not, am I not an equal human? Are you seeing me as an animal? Are you seeing me as an, as an object that you can just touch? Like, what is it? If you wouldn't do that too, you, you know, why are you doing that? So right. it, it, it's, it's a- it makes you think. Um, for me, I think, I grew up in Liverpool. I think it's funny if you ask this question to different, because I've been having these conversations with some of my um, like, like friends, family and all of that stuff. And not every black person thinks the same way as well. Not everyone is like, you know, I is even passionate about this whole thing. No, but even some, most people are. But some of them are also come from a place like from, maybe from London or Birmingham or even areas where it's densely populated with black people. And they've probably never experienced direct racism because they're around other black people right Mm -hmm. but for me I live in Liverpool Liverpool is very very white like there's just I can count the amount of black people I see when I go outside so growing up for me it was it was just that's all I that's all I experienced was racism it was walking out of your house and fearing the boys on the side because they're always going to shout something they're always going to shout the n-word to me they're going to make me feel threatened you know, sometimes they'll just do it for, for, for fun. You could just tell they just thought it was funny to say mm. that because I am threatened because one, I'm by myself and there's, you know, five, six of you. So it was like that stuff. There was communities where maybe I wasn't experienced, didn't experience it, but my other black friends in the, in, in Liverpool, but live somewhere different. They would, people would throw white paint at them. People used to um, throw like, we call them petty bombs. Like they were just like um, uh, petrol bomb, bombs, basically. There was small, uh, they'll throw them in letterbox boxes. So we've had families that their houses have gone on fire because of that stuff in Liverpool. We've had, um, so it's, you know, growing up that I experienced that all the time. It was almost it expected every time I went outside, it was almost expected that something would happen. I never got physically harmed or anything. And I went to a school when I, where I was the only black girl in a secondary school. 
at least for my first two years. So microaggressions all the time, you know, mm-hmm. all the time off the hair and your English is amazing. And oh my goodness, look, I'm as tanned as you. I'm almost as dark as you and this and that. And being told that my hair wasn't, couldn't, I couldn't wear my hair a certain way to school because it was distracting to the other kids. Like, that's school policy. Oh, that was, yeah, that was, it. well, I don't know if it was school policy, but that's what they told, to try to tell me to take my braids out because other, the other white kids, basically the other white kids weren't allowed braids, right? I think something like that. So I wasn't allowed braids, but I'm like, we are actually different. And the way I wear braids is not for, for like fun, <laughs> for style. It's protective hair, it's my hair, you know? So it was that kind of stuff. So for me and my parents as well, they've experienced the same thing to the point where they have a lot of trauma, especially my dad, you know, and that's based on where we live. And that's just because here racism was acceptable. So Mm -hmm. Now, number eight, a very powerful word and a word that is really something you need to understand. Prejudice, prejudice. Any form of prejudice is arguably completely wrong. An unfair or unreasonable opinion, feeling, belief, especially when it is formed without enough information, knowledge or thought. Laws against racial prejudice must be strictly enforced. Prejudice exists around the world for many different reasons. At the moment, I'm talking about racial prejudice. You can also be prejudiced for a number of different reasons against different groups. Number nine, bigotry. Bigotry. Now, bigotry doesn't have to be racial. It could also be religious bigotry. But this is, again, a prejudice. It's an intolerant prejudice which glorifies one's own group and denigrates, lowers another or others that have a different belief system, way of life, culture to your own. So racial bigotry would be saying my race, where I come from, who I am, my genetics are better than yours and they make me better than you. Now, racism manifests in a number of different ways. It is not simply down to the individual. Number 10, systematic racism. Systematic racism. This includes the laws, practices, policies that are entrenched in established institutions. This could be governmental, society, could also be companies, businesses, organisations, which results in the exclusion or promotion of certain groups. For many black people, systematic racism simply means that they find it more difficult. They have to work a lot harder in order to reach the same levels in their career and job opportunities as people of white skin. Systematic racism does not mean that there is an individual intent to disadvantage someone. It is simply that the system created does disadvantage a particular group of people or groups. There's things, again, I was just having this conversation, it's things that you can never prove. Yeah. If that makes sense. For example, um, I, unless it's, like over like it's in my face someone has said I'm not giving you this job because you're black I would never know that I went into an interview and I wasn't chosen because I was I was black however I know I don't ever feel held back because I've never allowed my skin color like I'm aware of it because the world has made me aware of it but I've never allowed it to make me feel like a victim to the Mm -hmm. point where I don't go for things I would never, and I, I, you know, people always say the race card, right? Like as if it's something I want to use. <laughs> like, yeah. no, I'd rather actually live in a society where I don't have to use the race card. But it, it's, yeah. you know, I, I never think, oh, I'm black, so I didn't get that thing. So if it did happen to me, I'm not aware of it, but I am aware that I did have less opportunity because of my color. Because I remember being in school, like I, I applied, I'm in medical school at the moment, but when I was first applying for medical school, I never had the resources and I never had the resources because I live in a society, I live in a, in a area which is really, really underprivileged. And that could have happened to my white counterparts as well. You know, maybe they also didn't have the resources and things like that. But I remember being in school and feeling like the teachers weren't paying as much attention to me, even though I kept asking. For example, I was put in set, when I first moved to a school, I was put in the very lowest set without any, any assessment of, am I even capable? of being in the highest set. My mom and dad had to fight for over six months to get me to even be assessed to be put in the highest set. And then they assessed me. And But the policy of the school is you assess people before you put them into any set. But they never assessed me. They put me straight into the lowest set. Six months I was in that set. And then eventually they moved me to the highest set. So that already, I can't prove that what that was because I'm black. I don't know. But it makes mm. me feel like maybe it was. 
you know, yeah, it makes I, you wonder. It makes you wonder. So yeah. I, I, it's it to be unless someone has said to me, I have not given you this because you're black. I can't prove it. You know, I can't. I might feel like it, but I can't prove it. Yes, I'm in medical school now. Yes, I um, I have a degree that I graduated with first class and all of that stuff. But could I, you know, the statistics say that black people in, at any job level are paid less than the white counterparts. That's what at the same, you know, or at certain age, or there's more likely, that's what the statistics say. But whether that's because of racism, whether that's because of lack of, I don't know. Like, that's I think it is, but I can't prove it. Now, this systematic racism, as I said, manifests in two specific ways. We have institutional racism. This is where racial discrimination comes from individuals carrying out the dictates of others, others who are prejudiced. Then we have structural racism. If we look at our society, we can see that there are predominantly, meaning mostly, white leaders. If you look at the British government as an example, how many of our MPs are white compared to black? I don't know that I have seen many black MPs at all. The black community, indeed many communities, are not represented in the UK government. This is an example of structural racism, where the people in power are those of white privilege, something we will be talking about in just a moment. Now we talk about government, but you can also find structural racism within companies and organisations. And again, this massively disadvantages the black community. Number 13, internalised racism. Internalised racism. Internalised racism is a situation that occurs within a racist system. When a racial group oppressed by racism supports the supremacy and dominance of the dominating group in this case, white people. They support the dominating group, the group oppressing them, by maintaining or participating in a set of attitudes, behaviours or social structures and ideologies that basically support white supremacy. Of course, we have individual racism, which refers to the individual beliefs of a person, their racist assumptions, their beliefs and behaviours, a form of racial discrimination that may be conscious or subconscious and form personal prejudice. Now, individual racism is connected to and learned from broader socioeconomic histories, and of course is supported and reinforced through systematic racism. Now, we talk about white supremacy, white supremacy, and that essentially means that it is the white people who are in positions of power, of dominance, and the ideology, the beliefs that we have in our society is that if you are white skinned, you are superior in some way. Now this leads us on to talk about white privilege, white privilege. And this is a term that you would have heard a lot in the news. Now white privilege, in all honesty, is not something that many white people will be aware of. But the Black Lives Matter movement is encouraging us to be aware of our white privilege. To understand that in life, if you are of fairer skin, then you are advantaged. Opportunities may be given to you that are not given to those of different coloured skin. Essentially, if you are white, you benefit from a system that oppresses others. You can refer to it as white privilege or white skinned privilege. So I think educating themselves and like Petty said, being a bit more compassionate to other people's issues and understanding that we're not fighting for an advantage in life. We're not protesting so we can have one up on everyone else. We're literally just protesting to be treated as equals and to start on the same level playing field as everyone else. Because we do feel like we're, we're born a step behind and we're playing mm-hmm. catch up and we're always just kind of fighting to catch up with everyone else. Because growing up black, you are taught you have to work two times harder. You have to be polite when you walk into rooms. You have to speak differently, talk differently. But these shouldn't be things because we're being taught that by our parents growing up but i guarantee Mm -hmm. you on the other side white parents are not educating their kids when you walk into a room be more polite you've got to just work harder than everyone else to get ahead they're not getting that so we're Mm -hmm. just fighting for to just make a change that allows everyone to play on the same field and to start on the same level so we're just fighting Mm -hmm. for equality not an advantage Mm -hmm. yeah oppression or the verb oppress A situation where people are governed in an unfair or cruel way and prevented from having opportunities and freedom. Oppression denotes, suggests, structural and material constraints, limitations. 
that significantly shape and influence a person's opportunities and possibilities. Number 18, discrimination. Discrimination or to discriminate. Treating a person or a particular group differently, particularly in a worse way than how you would treat people of your own group. This could be because of their skin color, their sex, their sexuality, or even their accent. Number 19, prevalent prevalent. Existing very commonly or often. Racism is still prevalent within our society. 20. Solidarity. Solidarity. People have been marching, protesting in solidarity with black people, in agreement or support for the members of a group, particularly a political group, or in this case, activists, people that have got a message to share, that are asking for political, economic, social change. And finally, a few words that I want you to keep in your mind when you are having these discussions. Tolerate, or the phrasal verb to put up with. To accept behavior, beliefs that are different to your own, although you may not agree or approve of them. Now, whilst you might be able to tolerate the neighbor making a little bit of noise upstairs, one thing that we can all not tolerate is racism. I will not tolerate racism. I will not accept it. I will not simply stand by and see racism, discrimination, prejudice occur. To speak out against, to speak out against, to speak out against racism, or to call it out, to call out racism, is to basically recognize it and say something about it, discuss it, address it, don't accept it, do not tolerate it. This is a time for change. And that change starts with conversation, with people recognizing, discussing, learning, and being willing to educate themselves. With the internet, there really is no excuse. Information is out there, websites are out there. YouTube videos are sharing amazing content about the Black Lives Matter movement. So your responsibility is to educate yourself. You're already doing it by watching this video and learning some of the vocabulary necessary to help you understand the Black Lives Matter movement. To help us eradicate, meaning remove, from existence, racism, because it is possible, but it is going to take time and it is going to take more than simply a hashtag. So I invite you now to watch the entire conversation and it is a long conversation. You might want it on in the background while you're cooking, but to watch the entire conversation that I had with Jess, Kimmy and Petty, listening to some of their experiences of racism, understanding what the Black Lives Matter movement means to them and how you can play your part. So thank you so much for watching the vocabulary here. So over to the conversation now. It is long, you might want it on in the background. And hopefully this conversation will inspire you, you to have your own conversations with friends, family, or even a stranger. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoy the full conversation. Okay, so. Let's jump straight in. The first question I really have uh, for both of you is, uh, what does the Black Lives Matter movement mean to you? Yeah. It's a very broad question, because I'm it is a broad answer as, as best yeah. you can. Yeah. I think for me, um, Black Lives Matter is just that. Like, we actually matter too. It's mm -hmm. not that we matter more. It's not that mm -hmm. we matter less, we just matter too. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when people understand that, because every time I think about that even, it always comes to my mind that there'll be someone watching who's like, well, all lives matter, right? There's that whole thing. That's what and I for me, about, yeah. yeah, and for me, it's like, of course, of course, all lives matter. No one's saying they don't. But yeah. right now, it's just, it feels like my life doesn't matter. That's what it feels exactly. like. It feels yeah. like me as a black person, my life doesn't matter. So I'm trying to say my life, it's almost like the hashtag or the, the movement should have been Black Lives Matter too. Yeah. Because yeah. that's what we're trying to say. The movement for me is trying to just, not even trying to convince anyone that, you know, because it's not my job to convince you to, to think common sense that human rights are human rights. Right. Um, but it's my, my ex lived experience of feeling like, I might not even have experienced it myself, but seeing my brothers and sisters being treated like they don't matter in some mm -hmm. communities. So that's what Black Lives Matter is just us trying to be like, guys, we, we are humans too. <laughs> and we matter too. Um, that's what it means to me because it just feels like right now in so many different parts of the world, it, well, in, all, in almost all parts of the world, our lives don't matter. 
exactly. Um, for me, uh, yeah, I would agree with Petty. Like it really does mean just like our, our lives matter too. And it, it, it confuses me that our fight to end racism is a debate. Like why, why do people combat ending racism or combat that black lives matter at all? Like it's, it's like the all lives matter, um, hashtag has been a racist hashtag. Like people just say all lives matter because they don't believe black lives matter. And I, and it is frustrating and it's really frustrating to see how blatant we get killed in the streets, which is why this hashtag came about because we're just, we're tired. We're tired of being treated, not treated equally. So it's like, for me, it does mean that our lives matter too. And we should be treated as such. Like we're just looking for equality. And many people have said it that, you know, you're lucky black people aren't looking for revenge because we are definitely do for it because <laughs> mm-hmm. it's just like it's just been so much happening to us over the years that are still happening people say slavery ended it didn't end it was just reformed into the police department mm-hmm. like so it's it's we've been putting up with so much and you could see now with all the protests and the riots people are tired we've had enough yeah. so yeah for me that's what black lives matter mean like just mm-hmm. treat us equally yeah mm-hmm. And I think it's really interesting that you say about the the hashtag that you should it should be Black Lives Matter Matter too. Um, mm-hmm. One thing I came across um, someone said about this this alternate hashtag All Lives Matter that they don't really understand the movement itself because yeah. all lives they said all lives can't matter until black until lives. Black Lives. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think that was like ah oh, okay yeah I get it yeah. that is what it's about yeah. Uh, and I think language is particularly powerful in, in pushing the movement forward because another thing that I've come across is that people will say, well, I'm not racist. But mm. then the argument there is, well, no, you, you should be anti-racist. Yeah. yeah. After, you know, it, it's important that people really do take a stand and, and that's what I, I see happening. Um, okay, I'm going to ask you another question that's a little bit more personal but kind of obviously relating to how you guys obviously feel is that, have you or even if you want to talk about someone that you know family member friend been affected by race racism have you felt that someone has been directly racist towards you and and how did you deal with that hmm. gosh i don't i don't i don't think i've experienced racism directly or or maybe i have and i've just suppressed the memory but um I remember or maybe I just about- or maybe I just didn't notice because there's like <laughs> micro like micro racism just everywhere just like little microaggressions where people just do things and it's like it is racist but you don't actually pick it up um but when this- we were at next 10 I remember you saying some I don't know if it was something about your hair someone making some comment on about your hair or something is that my imagination oh no oh yeah so no people always try to touch my hair so yes that is a thing that is a racist thing. You're right. Your hair. That's so insane. People are always trying to touch my hair. It is, it's, matter of fact, I was with one of my friends. Oh God, you just brought up a memory. Sorry. I was with one of my friends here in London. We were by the, the waterfront somewhere. I can't remember. It's like South London somewhere. Uh, and we were at this restaurant and we went to just like, we were getting takeout. And this white guy, I guess he was like a, some type of rich lawyer or whatever. He was talking to us. And um, one of his friends from the table walked up, clearly drunk. I could see it already. I'm like, oh my God, I'm looking at Tanda and I'm like, I want to go, but we already paid for this really expensive food. So it was like, I want to wait for my food though. So the guy starts coming up, he's talking to us and he just beelines toward me. And he's just looking at me and he's just like, I really love your hair and took both hands, before I could even react, both hands were already in my head and he was doing this. And I'm like, what the f-? And his friend was like, you can't do that. You can't just like touch her hair and tandem, like my friend Tandem, she was like, why are you touching her hair? And he was like, oh, it's fine. And I'm just like. But that's, uh, that's an great, like, space. It's, How is that different to grabbing someone's boobs? Exactly, or exactly. Any, not not even black people's hair. Anyone's hair. Like I wouldn't walk up, if I didn't know you. I wouldn't walk up to you and just like start playing with your hair. Like who does that? Yeah. So, like, it was, 
And then that's another thing that black people face. Cause it's like, if you show any type of rage or aggression, then you're an angry black woman. Yeah. So it's like, I had to hold everything in me back. Cause I wanted to fucking punch him in the face, but I was like, I knew they would have seen me as the aggressor. So I'm just like, I just really calmly told him, don't touch my hair. That's just so, it's just wrong. I mean, it's not over. Yeah. Racism doesn't have to be over. It doesn't have to be yeah. black, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For me, that's racist. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah, definitely. And you're right. And that's why I didn't think about it at Something first. Something is different about you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, it, even, even that, it's like, it makes you question. It, it's, there's so many layers to it because you start to think, what is it about me or you that makes you think that's okay? Like, am yeah. I not, am I not an equal human? Are you seeing me as an animal? Are you seeing me as an, as an object that you can just touch? Like, what is it? If you wouldn't do that to, you, you know, why are you doing that? So right. it, it, it's, a- it makes you think. Um, for me, I think, I grew up in Liverpool. I think it's funny if you ask this question to different, because I've been having these conversations with some of my um, like, like friends, family and all of that stuff. And not every black person thinks the same way as well. Not everyone is like, you know, I is even passionate about this whole thing. No, but even some, most people are. But some of them are also come from a place like from maybe from London or Birmingham or even areas where it's densely populated with black people. And they've probably never experienced direct racism because they're around other black people right mm-hmm. but from me i live in liverpool liverpool is very very white like there's just i can count the amount of black people i see when i go outside so growing up for me it was it was just that's all i that's all i experienced was racism it was walking out of your house and fearing the boys on the side because they're always going to shout something they're gonna, always going to shout the n-word to me they're going to make me feel threatened you know, sometimes they'll just do it for, for, for fun. You could just tell they just thought it was funny to say mm. that because I am threatened because one, I'm by myself and there's, you know, five, six of you. So it was like that stuff. There was communities where maybe I wasn't experienced, didn't experience it, but my other black friends in the, in, in Liverpool, but live somewhere different. They would, people would throw white paint at them. People used to um, throw like, we call them petty bombs. Like they were just like um, uh, petrol bomb, bombs, basically. There was small, uh, they'll throw them in letterbox boxes. So we've had families that their houses have gone on fire because of that stuff in Liverpool. We've had, um, so it's, you know, growing up that I experienced that all the time. It was almost it expected every time I went outside, it was almost expected that something would happen. I never got physically harmed or anything. And I went to a school when I, where I was the only black girl in a secondary school, at least for my first two years. So microaggressions all the time you know, mm-hmm. all the time off the hair and your English is amazing. And oh my goodness, look, I'm as tanned as you. I'm almost as dark as you and this and that. And being told that my hair wasn't, couldn't, I couldn't wear my hair a certain way to school because it was distracting to the other kids. Like that's school policy. Or, that was, yeah, that was, well, I don't know if it was school policy, but that's what they told to try to tell me to take my braids out because other the other white kids, basically the other white kids weren't allowed braids, right? I think or something like that. So I wasn't allowed braids, but I'm like, we are actually different. And the way I wear braids is not for, for like fun, <laughs> for style. It's protective hair, it's my hair, you know? So it was that kind of stuff. So for me and my parents as well, they've experienced the same thing to the point where they have a lot of trauma, especially my dad, you know? And that's based on where we live. And that's just because here racism was acceptable, so. Mm-hmm. Beyond racist attacks, we have this underlying issue of prejudice and this sense, this reality that if you are black, you are disadvantaged. There we go. You're disadvantaged. Forget your education, you know, your, how much money you've got in the bank. The color of your skin can hold you back. Um, mm-hmm. and it means that we've got, this is when we start talking about white privilege. Um, but this sense of prejudice, it could be whether you're, you know, going for a job interview and all these kind of things that are going on that they go under the radar they're not really something that we think about in day-to-day life at least as a white person you wouldn't think about Mm -hmm. it I went for a job interview and there's a black woman next to me and I'm thinking well yeah we'll probably we've got the same chance it wouldn't occur to me but the reality is there is that prejudice still Mm -hmm. in society and I could be getting the job just because of the color of my skin but it's not necessarily something that the people employing me are thinking of consciously Mm -hmm. That's what's concerning. So mm-hmm. 
talking about prejudice, do you feel that you, I mean, you, I think you two are very creative, talented, I know you are, creative, talented women, um, but, you know, educated. And, I mean, do you feel that you've been held back? From my point of view, I don't think you have. I think you've been very successful, but maybe there's things that have happened to you that you think, actually, if I was white, I would have had more opportunities. There's things, I would, again, I was just having this conversation, it's things that you can never prove. Yeah. If that makes sense. For example, um, I unless it's like over, like it's in my face, someone has said, I'm not giving you this job because you're black. I would never know that I went into an interview and I wasn't chosen because I was I was black. However, I know I don't ever feel held back because I've never allowed my skin color. Like I'm aware of it because the world has made me aware of it, but I've never allowed it to make me feel like a victim to the mm-hmm. point where I don't go for things. Mm-hmm. I would never, and I, I, you know, people always say the race card, right? Like as if it's something I want to use. <laughs> like, yeah. no, I'd rather actually live in a society where I don't have to use the race card. But it, it's, yeah. you know, I, I never think, oh, I'm black, so I didn't get that thing. So if it did happen to me, I'm not aware of it, but I am aware that I did have less opportunity because of my color. Because I remember being in school, like I, I applied, I'm in medical school at the moment. But when I was first applying for medical school, I never had the resources and I never had the resources because I live in a society, I live in a, in a area which is really, really underprivileged. And that could have happened to my white counterparts as well. You know, maybe they also didn't have the resources and things like that. But I remember being in school and feeling like the teachers weren't paying as much attention to me, even though I kept asking. For example, I was put in set when I first moved to a school, I was put in the very lowest set without any, any assessment of am I even capable of being in the highest set. My mom and dad had to fight for over six months to get me to even be assessed to be put in the highest set. And then they assessed me. And But the policy of the school is you assess people before you put them into any set. But they never assessed me. They put me straight into the lowest set. Six months I was in that set. And then eventually they moved me to the highest set. So that already, I can't prove that what that was because I'm black. I don't know. But it makes mm. me feel like maybe it was. You know, yeah, it I, makes you wonder. It makes you wonder so yeah. I, I it's it to be unless someone has said to me I have not given you this because you're black I can't prove it you know I can't I might feel like it but I can't prove it yes I'm in medical school now yes I um I have a degree that I graduated with first class and all of that stuff but could I you know the statistics say that black people in at any job level are paid less than the white counterparts that's what at the same, you know, or at certain age, or there's more likely, that's what the statistics say. But whether that's because of racism, whether that's because of lack of, I don't know. Like, I think it is, but I can't prove it. People can be disadvantaged because of the color of their skin. That's the case. Um, Yeah. I think we have Kimmy joining us. She's just connecting. Hey. (laughs) (laughs) You made it. Can you hear us? Oh, and she's gone. Oh, there she goes. How's that? Can you hear us? Yes. Cool. Hey. We're just, you joined us at a very pertinent time. We're just talking. We've, we've kind of started recording the conversation. Um, and we've talked about why the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, what, what it means to you. Um, we've mm-hmm. talked about kind of racism and kind of overt, covert racism where it's been directed towards you but we're actually talking about prejudice now and how you think or feel it may have held you back so we're, we're jumping straight in here so sorry <laughs> um but yeah maybe well, while you you kind of catch your breath um Jess can answer the same question whether she feels she's been held back at all by any kind of racial prejudice um I don't feel like I have been like I I guess in the career sense, I don't feel like I've been held back because um, I don't feel like I've I've gone for careers that uh, like Petty has that would, you know, have me be held back because of the color of my skin. Because like I I went for a more creative type career. Um, But I have but you can be held back in like the creative sense as well, because I've had experience with companies that. you know, mostly like Asian companies that didn't, you know, maybe like want me in pictures or want me a part of uh, certain 
events because of the color of my skin. Skin. It's like, it's, especially in the Asian culture, it's really hard to get in with that in, in on that platform because you're black, and they've been very just blatant about it. So I guess in that sense, I have. But um, I have had experience with uh, when I travel and like I would try to get an Airbnb. And I remember specifically when I was going to Berlin for an event and I needed an Airbnb and I applied for, I think, three or four. And then we started talking because, you know, you can't on Airbnb, you can't see anyone's profile picture or anything until you actually like start talking and you accept the um request to be in that specific Airbnb. So like when we started talking and I guess when they saw my picture, they said, oh, it's full or we can't, or we don't have any more room or it's already been booked. And then I would go back on the website and it would still be available. So I'm just like, hmm. And that was the first time. And then the second and the third time it happened. And I'm just like, all right, this is, this isn't a coincidence. Like this is definitely like the color of my skin type thing. So I did a little experiment. I took my picture off and I applied for another Airbnb and we talked and we got the Airbnb and everything was fine. I showed up. The girl looked like she was shocked that I was black. <laughs> she, she was like, oh, well, and then like she knew she couldn't just be like the room is not available anymore. So she was just like, well, here's your room and la la. And luckily I had an apartment all to myself. So I didn't have to like see her ever, but it was just the one time I had to see her. But like, she just had this look on her face. Like, why, why are you black kind of thing? I would be so angry. I I was, but at the same time, I kind of laughed it off. Cause I'm just like, it's, it's, it's terrible to say, but I'm used to it. And I think a lot of people are used to it. So it was just like, I was just like, whatever. Because I kind of knew it was going to happen when I took my picture off. So it's, it's, just, it's just one of those things that we deal with. It's just like an everyday thing that we just have to deal with. And that's what this movement, this continued movement, I hope, will be about. Is that actually, yeah. in that respect, you, you guys maybe should be saying, you know what, that's not good enough. And I think that's what people, people have been too, com- not complacent, yeah. in word, but accepting. That's what it is. Yeah. That's society. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. Whether it's on the part of a white person or a black person, feels like really just counterproductive. I think mm-hmm. it's like, you know, even um, what, like the whole thing, because I've, I've, sometimes people have said that as well. Like when, as a, as a white person, like say in that moment, you feel like you should, you should sign up for yourself. We do when we get killed, <laughs> you know, it's like we're scared, you know, people not, not you're scared. I, I it's, sometimes I am scared to stand up for myself because I'm, I know I can, but I will always be the aggressor. Like I mm-hmm. will, you know, and I will, the fact that someone, you know, like the, the, the video that we also recently of that, I think, I don't know her name. It was called Karen online, but I don't think that was actually, her name. <laughs> I think it was, I'm not sure. But she called the man on the, the police on the man because of the, his her dog, right? He asked her to just call the, you know yeah so you could you could as a black person you could be in the right but let's say Jess in that moment had been like let's say the person had if Jess had kind of why do you look surprised or something like that right and so you know if she had if it got into an altercation she in that moment the white person has the power because that's what racism is it's a power dynamic it's right Mm -hmm. now I have the power to exercise something so sometimes you just feel you choose your battles and you just don't Stand yeah. up for yourself in some moments because you know you're going to lose. You know that in that mm. moment, it, it, the system's not for you. The person can call the police. The police are going to come and arrest you, even without even knowing who called the police. Yeah. You know, so literally, okay. and that literally happened to a black guy in America. He called the police on a white guy trying to steal from his store, and the police arrested the black guy. <laughs> it was just like, and, the, and um. they didn't just arrest him. They beat him and then arrested him. So, in the UK, do you think we have? We, I, I don't. I hope we don't have the same level of kind of corruption within the police force as they do, and, and prejudice in the police force as they do in America. In America, it does feel like they're really, really backwards. I'm not gonna. They are. They are. They they definitely are. Yeah, I think in America it's it's quite extreme because obviously they have guns and stuff. Yeah. But here you still get it with stop and search and everything else. Like they will stop a lot of um, 
black guys just because they're black with no reason more than they stop like a white guy in a suit they just kind of target black guys and it's been shown in st- statistics that they mainly target black guys mm-hmm. in stopping searches yeah mm-hmm. I think it, it racism in general in, in England. And I think that's why sometimes it's hard for white people and even some black people to believe that there's racism in the UK because it's just more covert. It's not as, it, you know, America in general is extreme. They've got bigger food, bigger everything, right? So everything's just yeah. more extreme. Whereas in the UK, <laughs> we're more polite. We're more, we're almost more fake. We can fake it more. So it's, it doesn't seem as extreme. And because like what Kimmy said, they, the police don't have guns. If they had guns, best yeah. believe you would see the exact same thing because right now they are being stopped to search more, but that hence why there's more of them maybe in, in, you know, this whole mass incarceration thing. If you're going to stop us, mm-hmm. then more of us are going to be more in jail. You can't say it's because we're more violent or more criminal. No, it's because, you know, the, the bias thing. So, and even if it wasn't as bad, that's still not good enough. It just shouldn't be there in the first place. For me, in my job, I wouldn't say as much, but I think when I did acting before, you kind of see it everywhere you go. In terms of, especially when you're doing campaigns and adverts, you are the token black girl. So a lot of times, like, you would hear directors say, oh, can you wear your natural hair? Because they know in an advert, when they've only got, like, one black girl in it, if you're all walking together and you've got a wig on, no one can see diversity, but they want to show that, oh, we do diversity. So they need you with your natural hair just kind of popping out in the crowd. But at the same time, the role will have like 10 girls doing like a campaign together about makeup and you'll just be the only um, diverse diverse person there. And even on the call sheet, it just says they just want a person of colour. And that's just the one role. Other girls can be the one white ethnicity for all the other girls, but that one role is gonna has to be has to go to a person of colour. So when you go into the room, it's like you and four white girls and then you as a black girl in that group to see how you kind of your dynamics with the group and then they'll bring in like four white girls and then an Asian girl to see their dynamics and they'll take just one of you and that's it and it's kind of sad to see that because these brands are the ones now advocating saying oh black lives matter like we support diversity I'm thinking I've been to a lot of your auditions no you don't right like, yeah it's it's crazy or like a lot of times when me and James go on holiday, you will go to like a really nice shop. And if I go in by myself, you do kind of see they're looking at you, what you're doing. And then when James comes in and says, oh, how are you doing? How are you getting on? They just stop looking. Wow. And it's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like. Uh-oh, uh, I went away. Bless you, gone. Because <laughs> I, I got a phone call. I got to, hold on, let me put this on airplane mode or something. Oh, no, what happened? All okay, right. you know what? Yeah. I wanted to ask something specifically because you mentioned the voice <laughs> that's something that I did want to ask you um and be really direct about because your boyfriend's white you're black and yeah okay in this day and age people shouldn't think twice about it but I'm mm-hmm. wondering whether you have actually experienced anything directed towards you because of that oh my gosh uh YouTube people on YouTube don't hold back when it comes to the comments especially at the beginning uh, I think there's a lot of people who obviously because they're super pro-black, they will lash out at you because they feel like you're going against your race. And then there's Mm going to be like people from the other side who will also think that, oh, why is is he dating her? Why is he going beneath, like, you know, because they feel like, oh, you know. But um, you you just learn to ignore it, but it is a lot, especially because me, I support Black Lives Matter so much. And in my own way, I am pro-black and I do, and and stuff like that but at the same time a lot of people will think oh I'm against my own race or I don't I don't like black people I don't push anything towards like the black movement just because I'm dating James and it's quite the opposite really because even with him he's so supportive of everything his mom is out campaigning more than I am probably his sister's out campaigning and it's not a race thing I think they need to take out race when it comes to people being in relationships because you do fall for the person, you don't fall for the whole race. Mm-hmm. Like when I see James, I just see him as a human being. He could have come in any color, shape, size, and it, I would have still fallen in love with him. It's not the race. You're dating the person, not the race. And I think that's something people forget. It's yeah. Like, how, why should you need to even explain that fact? Yeah, yeah, I don't. I don't think you should. Eat. Like, I have to check my commenters because there's a lot of people in my comments. <laughs> my boyfriend, my boyfriend is white too, and like, I'll get comments like race mixers and all that I'll be like hold yeah. up <laughs> like, 
Cause, yeah, and cause my, like, into it. Yeah, like my com- my community my community knows I'm pro black all day every day. So yeah. it's like they hardly ever say anything to me about uh, me and Billy. But it's like I you do get those couple of people that do have like the balls to say some stuff, and it's like either I like. Like Petty said, you pick your battles, but sometimes I got to go in on them. Other times I just need <laughs> it. <laughs> Depends on what they say. But yeah, you do get those couple of people. I think that it's, I think that it's important for people. Like if you are just a, just a basic, logical thinking human being to understand that it's not a competition of struggle. Like it's not, you know, when I say that I'm struggling as a black person, if you're a white, Asian, whatever, it's, it's not a, well, I struggle more. Okay. And if you were struggling more, I would want to help you. I wouldn't come to you. In the same way you wouldn't, if your friend said something, my leg hurts, you wouldn't say, well, I have two legs that hurt. You know, it, you help your friend. It's, we have to come to a basic understanding that we should all just care for each other. I don't know how to explain mm-hmm. it. It's, it's, it's not a competition. It's not for someone to come and say, well, that's not true. This is not true. This, we, like what, what Jess said, when I, when we say there's racism, it shouldn't be a debate. It just mm-hmm. accept it that there is, because I'm telling you that there is, because that's what I've experienced. And let's let's see how we can help each other as as mm-hmm. as just as co-humans, right? So whatever race you are, um, whether you're, because when we say racism, we we are using white people as 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 a as an example because we're talking about white supremacy. But racism mm-hmm. comes from all other races against black people. Of mm-hmm. course, they're also yeah. So it's it's. I think for how people can help is firstly just to listen, like what people are saying, and actually just accept that this is the truth that's happening, and have some compassion. Genuinely try find compassion in your heart that another human is struggling over something that you possibly have power to change. And mm-hmm. you have power to change it by many different ways, you know, and we can go into discussion of how that is in a, in a sec. But when we just, when you just, if you're listening to this and maybe you're struggling to understand it, maybe you've come from a point of privilege or maybe you don't even accept that you have privilege, fine. But understand that when we're telling you that we are hurting, we really are. And just as if your friend would be telling you that they're hurting, just come from a point of compassion first and only then can you even put yourself in a position to try and help anyone because if you don't come from that point either you're going to just be performing performance activism was we're calling it performing or we're, you're going to do it out of pressure out of fear out of um guilt out of shame and we don't want any of that we just want people to help or to feel like they, they do something out of genuine compassion for their fellow mm-hmm. human and only then can we actually i believe create any change mm-hmm. i agree um, I think change could also be brought about if, you know, like the white community actually called out their racist counterparts, like if they actually said something. And that's why we say like there aren't any good police because like they'll be like, oh, there's good police officers. But like you just stand there and watch it happen. Like you don't do anything like that. That officer kneeled on George Floyd's neck, George Floyd's neck for what, eight minutes and 46 seconds, and none of the cops around him did anything. Like, it's, it's those type of things that keeps racism alive because you're not doing anything to stop it or to make a change. And I think it starts with, you know, the white communities, the Asian communities, just like, you know, all different communities talking to each other and calling each other out on their racism mm-hmm. because a lot of communities don't do that. They don't call each other out on their racism. They just let it happen. Mm-hmm. And that's never like nothing is ever going to change unless we call each other out and we make a change within our own communities as well yeah oh is it me (laughs) (laughs) oh no i was just gonna say i think a lot of people need to just shush and listen because this isn't the first time people are speaking out about it and a lot of people have been kind of closed off to it and deaf to the cries because this has been happening for a long time. And I think the first step is people just educating themselves on the issues that are going on right now because a lot of the counter arguments coming out, like they have zero sense. They actually 
people are not doing their research at all. So I think educating themselves and like Patty said, being a bit more compassionate to other people's issues and understanding that we're not fighting for an advantage in life. We're not protesting so we can have one up on everyone else. We're literally just protesting to be treated as equals and to start on the same level playing field as everyone else. Because we do feel like we're, we're born a step behind and we're playing mm -hmm. catch up and we're always just kind of fighting to catch up with everyone else because growing up black, you are taught you have to work two times harder. You have to be polite when you walk into rooms. You have to speak differently, talk differently. But these shouldn't be things because we're being taught that by our parents growing up. But I guarantee mm -hmm. you on the other side, white parents are not educating their kids. When you walk into a room, be more polite. You've got to just work harder than everyone else to get ahead. They're not getting that. So we're mm -hmm. just fighting for, to just make a change that allows everyone to play on the same field and to start on the same level so we're just yeah. fighting mm -hmm. for equality not an advantage mm -hmm. yeah exactly and I, and like what you said that um the 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 usual um counter of i'm not racist right and what you're saying is be, but we want anti-racist and someone might not understand what that means but you know there's this whole thing about implicit bias and everyone has implicit bias like me i i'm more likely going go i'm more likely going to choose someone who might looks like me who talks like me who whatever because or even in relationships you know there's that whole study that most people choose people who look like them because mm -hmm. that's just what we, it's almost it's subconscious so when you as a as a as a white person in power understand that you might not be racist but when someone walks into a job interview that subconscious in you is biased already towards the white person. And if you don't know that, you could think that I'm not racist, which is true. You're not racist in the sense that you're not prejudiced. You're never going to call someone out and do the da 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 But if 90% if, if of the population is, is, in, is white and you're all in power and then you have bias and then someone comes in to an interview, your bias doesn't mean that you are this prejudiced racist person, but you're just going to choose someone who looks more like you. If two people are just as qualified, you're more likely going to choose the white person. So when you're aware of that, if you're checking yourself at every moment and bringing that to your consciousness of, okay, why am I choosing this person? Am I choosing this person because they, they are better? Or right now I just feel more comfortable around them because they look like me. They make me feel comfortable. They talk like me. You know, if you're just more aware of that, it could actually help in a workplace if you're in a position of power. So mm -hmm. that's why when we're saying educate yourself, understand what even, you know, another term that's coming up recently, white fragility. Why is it that you feel when I, when black people are so comfortable with talking about race, because race has been very prominent in our lives because we're aware of it from the time when we're like five. Mm -hmm. But white people, for the most part, have never had to address their race. So that's why they're even uncomfortable of saying black person. You know, someone mm -hmm. will say, they can't say it. Oh, if I say white person, it's like, if you feel like it, that moment, that's your fragility because, yeah. Sometimes with that though, I'm saying black person, I'm saying white person, but even I have sometimes wondered, am I saying the right thing? Am I going to offend anybody? There's mm -hmm. a sense of, I don't want to upset anyone or say the wrong thing. Because yeah. Terms, which ones are you know PC nowadays because just yeah. know, our society has become a bit sensitive mm -hmm. and, and yeah. conscious not to prejudice people and not to you know talk about them in a derogatory way. So yeah, the word black even for me, I'm like okay, I'm going with this. I'm just going to say black because people are. That's why yeah. I'm going to say it, and I'm not going to you know skirt around the word and because I don't see how you can without and not have a proper discussion. It just doesn't work. Yeah. So I, yeah. I think maybe it is just a case of, you know, is that what terms are okay to use? Mm -hmm. like, which it might sound stupid, but ask white people. Yeah, maybe yeah. there is. Yeah, it's always safer to ask. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, I mean, think sometimes it's more harmful when people just group everyone together and just instead, inter like instead of addressing one particular issue because they don't want to offend that particular group, they group everyone together, people of color the vain mm -hmm. society it's just sometimes that's more offensive than just asking that like, what's the best way to address this particular group of people yeah mm -hmm. i i would actually rather appreciate someone ask me before they say anything is this okay and, you know I, yeah yeah okay and that's what um first of all okay so it's not necessarily my job to to educate every single person a white person about race like of course there's other you know there's google you know, you can, mm -hmm. there's, there's books, like what is it? You know, that's what we're saying by research. We don't mean research as in 
you know, do extensive, you know, meta analysis on this, not just read a book about, you know, race, read a book about, you know, we can probably suggest some books, but, or, or your friends, if you're comfortable with someone, ask them, you know, are you comfortable when someone says black or person of color? And maybe, maybe, and for every black person, it might be different. And that's where also as black people, we need to also take, take um, responsibility of not to cancel people so quickly when they're trying to learn. Like let Ooh, cancel culture is so toxic. You know, it's not okay. Yeah. And take responsibility because like what you said, some white people are scared to say something because as soon as they say something wrong, everyone's like, you know, and it's like, you know, sometimes it really is innocent in the sense that like what you're saying, you're like, okay, everyone's saying black now. So I'm going to say black and you've just learned that. But if you did say something wrong, I feel like sometimes it takes for someone to say something wrong, as long as that's not their behavior, you know, someone's behavior is consistent. Mm -hmm. But if someone genuinely says something wrong, just correct them quickly. And if they take responsibility, okay, I'm sorry, I, should, I didn't know that. Okay, we move on. And let's yeah. move on and actually learn how to educate each other without canceling each other so quickly, because mm -hmm. that's how do you expect people to change? You know, someone changes and then you're like, well, you weren't doing that five years ago. Okay, well, now they are. Yeah, so they, allow them they've to changed. Change, yeah. You know, that we are asking for change. And then when people change, we're like, it's not, you know, it's not good enough. This whole, it's not good mm -hmm. enough culture. Yeah, there is yeah. true some things which are not good enough, but some things are. Like if someone says, oh, I didn't know people of color was not the right thing to say right now because I'm grouping people, then okay, that's fine. You've learned, don't say it again. Okay, we move mm -hmm. on. You know, so right. I think it's important for both sides to kind of like, si I say sides, but you know, whatever. Um, I, think that it's, I think that it's important for people. Like if you are just a, just a basic logical thinking human being to understand that it's not a competition of struggle like it's not you know when i say that i'm struggling as a black person if you're a white asian whatever it's it's not a, well i struggle more okay and if you were struggling more i would want to help you i wouldn't come to you in the same way you wouldn't if your friend said something my leg hurts you wouldn't say well i have two legs that hurt you know it, you help your friend it's we have to come to a basic understanding that we should all just care for each other. I don't know how to explain mm -hmm. it. It's, it's, it's not a competition. It's not for someone to come and say, well, that's not true. This is not true. This, we, like what, what Jess said, when, I, when we say there's racism, it shouldn't be a debate. It just mm -hmm. accept it that there is, because I'm telling you that there is, because that's what I've experienced. And let's, let's see how we can help each other as, as, mm -hmm. as just as co-humans, right? So whatever race you are, um, whether you're, cause when we say racism, we, we were using white people as, as, as a, as an example, because we're talking about white supremacy, but racism mm -hmm. comes from all other races against black people. Of mm -hmm. course, they're also, yeah. So it's, it's, I think for how people can help is firstly just to listen, like what people are saying and actually just accept that this is the truth that's happening and have some compassion genuinely try find compassion in your heart that another human is struggling over something that you possibly have power to change and mm -hmm. you have power to change it by many different ways you know and we can go into discussion of how that is in a, in a sec but when we just when you just if you're listening to this and maybe you're struggling to understand it maybe you've come from a point of privilege or maybe you don't even accept that you have privilege fine but understand that when we're telling you that we are hurting we really are and just as if your friend would be telling you that they're hurting, just come from a point of compassion first and only then can you even put yourself in a position to try and help anyone. Because if you don't come from that point, either you're going to just be performing, performance activism was we're calling it, performing, or we're, you're gonna do it out of pressure, out of fear, out of um, guilt, out of shame. And we don't want any of that. We just want people to help or to feel like they, they do something out of genuine compassion for their fellow mm -hmm. human. And only then can we actually, I believe, create any change. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, I think change could also be brought about if, you know, like the white community actually called out their racist counterparts. Like if they actually said something, and that's why we say like there aren't any good police because like they'll be like oh there's good police officers but like you just stand there and watch it happen like you don't do anything like that that officer kneeled on george floyd's neck george floyd's neck for what eight minutes and 46 seconds and none of the cops around him did anything like it's it's 
those type of things that keeps racism alive because you're not doing anything to stop it or to make a change. And I think it starts with, you know, the white communities, the Asian communities, just like, you know, all different communities talking to each other and calling each other out on their racism. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of communities don't do that. They don't call each other out on their racism. They just let it happen. Mm -hmm. And that's never, like nothing is ever going to change unless we call each other out and we make a change within our own communities as well. Yeah. Oh, is it me? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no, I was just going to say, I think a lot of people need to just shush and listen because this isn't the first time people are speaking out about it. And a lot of people have been kind of closed off to it and deaf to the cries because this has been happening for a long time. And I think the first step is people just educating themselves on the issues that are going on right now, because a lot of the counter arguments coming out, like they have zero sense. They actually, people are not doing their research at all. So I think educating themselves and like Petty said, being a bit more compassionate to other people's issues and understanding that we're not fighting for an advantage in life. We're not protesting so we can have one up on everyone else. We're literally just protesting to be treated as equals and to start on the same level playing field as everyone else. Because we do feel like we're we're born a step behind and we're playing Mm -hmm. catch up and we're always just kind of fighting to catch up with everyone else. Because growing up black, you are taught you have to work two times harder. You have to be polite when you walk into rooms. You have to speak differently, talk differently. But these shouldn't be things because we're being taught that by our parents growing up, but I guarantee mm-hmm. you on the other side, white parents are not educating their kids. When you walk into a room, be more polite. You've got to just work harder than everyone else to get ahead. They're not getting that. So we're mm-hmm. just fighting for, to just make a change that allows everyone to play on the same field and to start on the same level. So we're just yeah. fighting mm-hmm. for equality, not an advantage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And like, and like what you said, that um, the, 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 usual um counter of i'm not racist right and what you're saying is be, but we want anti-racist and someone might not understand what that means but you know there's this whole thing about implicit bias and everyone has implicit bias like me i i'm more likely going go i'm more likely going to choose someone who might looks like me who talks like me who whatever because or even in relationships you know there's that whole study that most people choose people who look like them because mm-hmm. that's just what we, it's almost it's subconscious so when you as a as a as a white person in power understand that you might not be racist but when someone walks into a job interview that subconscious in you is biased already towards the white person and if you don't know that you could think that i'm not racist which is true you're not racist in the sense that you're not prejudiced you're never going to call someone out and do the but if 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 90 percent of the population is is in is white and you're all in power and then you have bias and then someone comes in to an interview your bias doesn't mean that you are this prejudiced racist person, but you're just going to choose someone who looks more like you. If two people are just as qualified, you're more likely going to choose the white person. So when you're aware of that, if you're checking yourself at every moment and bringing that to your consciousness of, okay, why am I choosing this person? Am I choosing this person because they, they are better or right now I just feel more comfortable around them because they look like me. They make me feel comfortable. They talk like me. You know, if you're just more aware of that, it could actually help in a workplace if you're in a position of power. So mm-hmm. that's why when we're saying educate yourself, understand what even, we you know, another term that's coming up recently, white fragility. Why is it that you feel when I, when black people are so comfortable with talking about race, because race has been very prominent in our lives because we're aware of it from the time when we're like five. Mm-hmm. But white people, for the most part, have never had to address their race. So that's why they're even uncomfortable of saying black person. You know, someone mm-hmm. will say, they can't say it. Oh, if I say white person, it's like, if you feel like it, that moment, that's your fragility because, yeah. Sometimes with that though, I'm saying black person, I'm saying white person, but even I have sometimes wondered, am I saying the right thing? Am I going to offend anybody? There's mm-hmm. a sense of, I don't want to upset anyone or say the wrong thing. Because yeah. Terms, which ones are you know PC nowadays because just yeah. you know, our society has become a bit sensitive Cattle. and, and yeah. conscious not to prejudice people and not to you know talk about them in a derogatory way. So yeah, the word black even for me, I'm like okay, I'm going with this. I'm just going to say black because people are. That's fine. Yeah. I'm going to say it and I'm not going to 
you know, skirt around the word and because I don't see how you can without and not have a proper discussion. It just doesn't work. Yeah. So I, yeah. I think yeah. Maybe it is just a case of, you know, is that what terms are okay to use? Mm -hmm. Which it might sound stupid, but ask white people. Yeah, maybe yeah. there is. Yeah, it's always safer to ask. Yeah, right? yeah. Because sure. I, I mean, think sometimes it's more harmful when people just group everyone together and just instead, in like instead of addressing one particular issue because they don't want to offend that particular group, they group everyone together. People of color, the BAME mm -hmm. society. It's just sometimes that's more offensive than just asking that. Like, what's the best way to address this particular group of people? Yeah, mm -hmm. I I would actually rather appreciate someone ask me before they say anything, is this okay? And, you know, I, yeah. Yeah. It's okay. And that's what, um, first of all, okay, so it's not necessarily my job to, to educate every single person, a white person about race. Like, of course, there's other, you know, there's Google, you know, you can, <laughs> mm -hmm. there's, there's books. Like, what is it? You know, that's what we're saying by research. We don't mean research as in, you know, do extensive, you know, meta-analysis on this. No, just read a book about, you know, race. Read a book about, you know, we can probably suggest some books, but, or, or your friends, if you're comfortable with someone, ask them, you know, are you comfortable when someone says black or person of color? And maybe, maybe, if, and for every black person, it might be different. And that's where also as black people, we need to also take, take um, responsibility of not to cancel people so quickly when yeah. they're trying to learn. Like, let Ooh, people- cancel culture is so toxic. And, you know, it's not okay. Yeah. And take responsibility because like what you said, some white people are scared to say something because as soon as they some, say something wrong, everyone's like, you know, and it's like, you know, sometimes it really is innocent in the sense that like what you're saying, you're like, okay, everyone's saying black now, so I'm going to say black and you've just learned that. But if you did say something wrong, I feel like sometimes it takes for someone to say something wrong, as long as that's not their behavior, you know, someone's behavior is consistent. Mm -hmm. But if someone genuinely says something wrong, just correct them quickly. And if they take responsibility, okay, I'm sorry, I, should, I didn't know that. Okay, we move on. And let's yeah. move on and actually learn how to educate each other without cancelling each other so quickly because mm -hmm. that's how do you expect people to change? You know, someone changes and then you're like, well, you weren't doing that five years ago. Okay, well, now they are. Yeah, so they've, allow them they've to changed. Change. Yeah. You know, that we are asking for change and then when people change, we're like, it's not, you know, it's not good enough. This whole it's not good mm -hmm. enough culture. Yeah, there is yeah. true some things which are not good enough, but some things are. Like if someone says, oh, I didn't know people of color was not the right thing to say right now because I'm grouping people, then okay, that's fine. You've learned, don't say it again. Okay, we move mm -hmm. on. You know, so right. I think it's important for both sides to kind of like, si I say sides, but you know what I mean. But then, yeah. I feel that yeah. that's great that there is this sense, you know. No, I don't hear anything. Can't hear you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Hi. Okay. Now? Now we can. Yeah, now we yeah, can. Yeah, I can't hear you. Sounds okay. Yeah. 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 Bloody internet. It doesn't matter when it's students because they don't listen anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, thank you. That kind of it clears a lot of things up. And I, yeah, I think there is an issue. I know a few uh, pretty big YouTubers that do want to do something, that want to voice their opinion, that well, not voice their opinion, but voice their support for the movement. But they are scared to do anything. Mm -hmm. It is a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. and there is. Mm -hmm someone that's not happy with you speak now and if you are white what right do you have to say anything which is kind of why I, I wanted to kind of connect with you guys to really get a proper understanding because like I said I'm not qualified to talk about this um all I can and do I think but I I think it's important you said that because I feel like you are qualified to talk about it because not that you're qualified to talk about my experience right what you're qualified to talk about is your experience as in that you know when people say that white people are qualified to talk about white supremacy because that's where it came you know what i mean like it's not saying you're in the same way right it's like this you don't just because you're white doesn't mean you know all the history about white people and mm. you know how white people came about or how the you know the idea came about or how slavery came. it doesn't mean you're not just because i'm black don't mean i know everything and everybody about black history and when what year slavery you know i don't you know, my blackness does not make me an expert of black people. Just in the same way, your whiteness doesn't make you an expert of white people. So mm -hmm. sometimes as well, it, it puts a lot of pressure on black people to educate because it's like, well, 
you know, educate us. And it's, I understand where that's coming from, but I can only tell you about my experience, but I can't educate you about blackness because I have to research it in the same way you have to research it. I, I hate that educate us thing though, because it's like, mm. that's just pure laziness. You have Google, just like, go and look up what it is that you don't understand. Like I, exactly like you said, we don't have all the answers. So it's That's like so for those people that say, well, I need, I need you to educate me. No, educate your fucking self. Like go, go look it up. <laughs> it's like, it's not that hard. That's just, that's just a cop out for me, honestly. Yeah, 100%. And it doesn't necessarily mean the facts and figures. It can just mean educate me on your experience. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because yeah, I'm not expecting you to be an encyclopedia on colonialism and. <laughs> um, yeah. But sure, your experience is the, is the thing that, I think is more eye-opening for me and mm -hmm. facts and statistics on Google is is it's distancing yourself from it whereas when you're actually connecting with a person and you're yeah. hearing how they feel that's what actually hits you hardest facts yeah. are, mm -hmm. they're distant there's there's no emotion behind it, it yeah sure but it's the connection that I think is really important yeah that's true yeah, no, if someone asked me personally about my experiences, then I'd be like, yeah, cool, I'll talk to you about it. But, like, the, the, the people that I'm speaking about, about educate me, like, those are just, like, those people that just want just facts, like, a broader understanding where you could actually just go look that up yourself. Like, you could just yeah. look up that information as I could because I might not have the answers. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's just what I mean by that. And I just feel like that's just a huge cop-out or just, like, an excuse. Like, if they say something racist and they're like, oh, I didn't know, educate me. And it's like, no. You, you knew that was racist when you said it. <laughs> I'm not being racist, Mark. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> when, that sentence, when have you heard someone say, I'm not being racist, Mark? Uh, people will say it before they say anything racist, right? It's like, I'm not yeah. being racist, but I just feel like, you know, black, black women are a bit loud and a bit ratchet. So mm -hmm. you are being racist. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> like, you just yeah. definitely racist. <laughs> you know, I'm not being racist, but you know black men can be a bit intimidating when they wear you know so you are being racist you know so. yeah, you're literally being racist mm. yeah. well thank you i mean is there anything you guys really want to add or think that we haven't covered or i feel like you've done a pretty good job there yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like we had a pretty good conversation. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly that was what I was expecting from you guys because it, it does it does open my eyes to things that I wasn't really aware of that, you know, I would look at the U the US and I'd go, Well yeah, of course, because they're backwards and they've got, you know, Calvin. Well, be, being an American, I do not dispute your claims <laughs> of the US being backwards. But then I would think, well, but in the UK we're better than that. Well, no. Because there's other things going on, uh, issues. There's things that maybe aren't so obvious. We don't have guns, so you're not going to get someone shot like that. Mm -hmm. So, but it's important that we are addressing it here. Um, yeah. yeah. What happens in America happens in America. Uh, hopefully, it will have a broader reach and it will continue to make change in America because it does feel like how at this stage in society is it still that bad, particularly in America? It, it, it. I can't fathom it. I really yeah. because I, I've been watching some, I watched a film the other day, um, it was called, someone recommended it to me, it was called The Green Book. Oh, uh, love that, love that movie. Yeah. I watched that and I was like, okay, that's incredible, but you go down to the southern states, it's probably not that much better in some places. Yeah, no. And that was no. 70 years ago or whatever. So, yeah. It's and it's 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 like our, like what you were saying. If I, if I was to leave something to tell people, like especially if you're in the UK, it's to really really like dispel the idea that it's it's not as bad. It, it's just different. It's not. Yeah. It's, it's as bad. It's just different. It's you know. Look at Meghan Markle. I mean, I was no. literally about to say that. I was literally about. To she say literally that. was driven out of this country because of racism. It, it, you know, people can, can, we can, people can argue about it, but, you know, I saw, I saw, um, this thing, it was, um, two, se two separate comparisons of how they, the media reported about Meghan Markle and how they reported about, um, what's her name? Kate. Kate Middleton. And it was the exact same thing. You know, when Meghan Markle wore something, it was, oh, this is too revealing for this. And if, when Kate wore it, it was nice. Or when Meghan Markle was, 
it, it was this stark difference, you know, that, that, that it was. And that's how, like, hidden, I would say it's not hidden for us because we see it, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not yeah. October, but it is there. So I think it's like, it, it's just different. So it's, it's a matter of, of understanding that just because it's different doesn't mean it's not there. And then from mm-hmm. there, we can actually tackle it because when we don't see it, then we can't tackle it. Um, but when yeah. we actually see it, then we know, okay, so it's a bit different, but it's there. Yeah, yeah. It's they do that with footballers as well. Oh yeah, they do. Yeah, they do it with footballers all the time. When um when one like a, when a black footballer buys a home for their mum, it's like oh he's flashing out on this, just like showing off. But when a white footballer does it, it's like oh my gosh, so sweet. Look at this generous footballer buying a home for his dear mum. And it's like the same thing when they're doing a story on a black guy. He could have done the nicest thing, but they use such a bad image of him. And then mm-hmm. when it's their other way, they use such a nice picture of him and say, oh, maybe it's anger issues. Mm-hmm. In the same way, like <laughs> we've been saying about when, if there is a second wave of Corona, the images that will be used won't be the people that were at the beach. You know, the vast. Yeah. It's going to be the protest. It's, it's yeah. going to be the protest. That's, it. That, that's what I was talking about. And they're not going to include the far-right protests either. Yep. They're, they're, not, not, gonna, gonna include they're not going to include those protests at all. Yeah. The one that yeah. happened yesterday. Yeah. So They're not going to include that one. Right. <laughs> Just like, and the, the thing that killed me, though, is like a lot of them were like, well, Winston Churchill, he, he defeated Hitler, blah, blah, blah. But they're at the, they're at the statue going, see Kyle. Like, they're at the statue doing the Nazi, uh, I'm like, what? Like, make it make sense. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. It's just so stupid. And they even spelt their own thing wrong, remember? They spelt Britain wrong on their no. flag. Yeah, they did. <laughs> they did. It just shows you the level of education some of those people have. They spelled Literally. Britain wrong, yeah. And for me, I think those people, like, I, I, again, I was having a conversation about this. Like, me as a Black person, who am I trying to reach? And for me, I'm not trying to reach that person the person yeah. who who is you know the person who is just racist and it's because you know um there's this i can't remember her name julie elliott or something she's a white lady who used to teach about racism back in the day yeah anyway, oh Je- oh jane elliott oh that's, jane elliott, that's, 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 that's my one. bitch right there i love her <laughs> she's she's really <laughs> she's really good about it so you know if you want to hear from a white person talk about race mm-hmm. you just listen to that mm-hmm. woman but she talks about how it's mental it's a mental issue like you actually have yeah. a mental disorder and there's a set there's like diff, it's a spectrum i always say it there's these people on the far right i guess you want, i don't know what yeah that are just gone ho about you know they don't make sense you don't even make yeah, sense at you all. are uneducated you don't those are the people i'm not trying i'm not trying to reach those people because that's mm-hmm. not my portion i'm trying mm-hmm. to reach the average white person that doesn't think they're racist and yeah. is, is not doing anything, is silent or, and because they're scared, because of whatever, or because of it, you know, that might have implicit bias, whatever, whoever that person is, um, that's the person, because that's the person that is willing to change. That's the person that is willing to check themselves. That's the person that's willing to be like, okay, I'm not racist, but how can I be anti-racist? That's the person that's willing to change their structures in their business. That's the person that's willing to be an ally, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, the, that's the person that we, are trying to reach because only they can fight for us in this mm-hmm. system um as much as we black people are like we can create our own of course we can we we are trying to and we will but at the end of the day we still need help to get into some places so those mm-hmm. are the people that i'm trying to reach those far right people nah they're gonna be racist till they die <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah 